today on CityCast Denver. Lori Smith of Littleton is a website designer, but just like Jack Phillips of the famous Masterpiece Cake Shop in Lakewood, she doesn't want to work on anything to do with gay marriage, which would put her business at odds with Colorado's anti-discrimination law. This week, her case made it all the way to the Supreme Court. CPR's justice reporter Allison Sherry was in Washington to hear oral arguments on Monday, and she's on today to explain what's at stake and why this always seems to happen in Colorado. Today is Thursday, December 8th, 2022. I'm Bree Davies, and this is CityCast Denver. Allison Sherry, welcome back to CityCast Denver. Thanks, Bree. Thanks for inviting me. So there's a Colorado case that's before the U.S. Supreme Court as we speak involving a website designer who says it goes against her religious beliefs to create wedding websites for queer couples. Can you talk about what Lori Smith, who's the owner of 303 Creative, is is saying with her case? Yes. um, Lori Smith does not currently create wedding websites, but she wants to. She says that she has been wanting to create wedding websites since she was a child, when she watched her mom, who was an artist um, in a store. So, But because she doesn't believe in gay marriage or same-sex marriage, she wants to exclude those couples who would seek out that service from her business so she wants to post a a message on her website that says i'm open for wedding design business but i don't i will not accept same-sex couples because of my religious beliefs she actually hasn't posted that yet she wants to but she does feel that colorado's public accommodations law would deem that illegal Um, and i think we've clarified that it would Um, And so she sued the state because she felt like she couldn't do the business that she wanted to do. And here we go. It went all the way through the lower courts, the Tenth Circuit, and landed at the Supreme Court this year, and they accepted the case. Okay. And then how is the state arguing this case? Because Attorney General Phil Weiser has said that it could potentially open the door to discrimination against other marginalized groups. So the state sees creative businesses like hers the same as any business. I think they would say, look, like any business has a creative element. You could own a tire shop. You could own a store that rents out chairs for weddings. All of those businesses, if you operate in the as a public accommodation in Colorado, which is that you are open for business, basically, is kind of the definition of public accommodation business, You can't turn away business from protected classes of people. Now, in Colorado, that would be, you know, anyone, um, you know, race, ethnicity, gender, disability, LGBTQ status. They cannot be turned away based on who they are in a public business in Colorado. So they're saying, look, we don't see a website business different than we would see a restaurant or a hotel. Now, could could a business say, like, a wedding cake business, you know, to hearken to another case here, um, say, I don't want to make a wedding cake for the Ku Klux Klan because I don't I don't believe in that and I think that's racist and that doesn't they actually can turn that away because that the Ku Klux Klan is not a protected class. What makes this special is because the LGBTQ that population is a protected class in Colorado under Colorado's public accommodations laws. I'm also thinking about how you can walk into a store and it'll have a sign that says we have the right to refuse service to anyone. But that's not I based that's on true. protected class status. <laughs> that's more of like, maybe it's up for interpretation. I'm just thinking about it like, oh, yeah. you can't come in because you're drunk. <laughs> you know? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Or, or, you know, they could be too busy or they don't have time to deal with you. I mean, you know, businesses churn away business all the time. They don't have the capacity. They don't. Um, There's no space. There's no room. They don't want to do a wedding up in Evergreen. They want to stay in Denver. You know, there's all of that is legal. It's all completely fine in the course of everyday commerce. What is not what is not legal is to say because you're um, a same sex sex couple, I'm not going to make you know, I'm not going to do this for you. Um, That's where it would cross in the state's view a line of violating the public accommodations law, which is, exists, you know, by the way, these exist in m- most states. 
And they have been in existence since the Civil Rights Act, since the 60s. And it really, you know, goes back to when, you know, people of color, mostly black people, were not allowed to go into restaurants or sit at soda fountains and that sort of thing. And I think the state would say it's very important to us that we keep businesses um, from discriminating, that there is a there is a marketplace for people, for this protected classes of people to go and not fear discrimination. Well, and I think it's helpful that you bring up the civil rights, uh, the roots of this being it used to be, you know, in America, this separate at one point, the separate but equal like there were signs visibly everywhere mm-hmm. that said who could and could not enter or utilize a business. And mm-hmm. so we're living in the results of those changes. And this is kind of a case that's challenging that. Yes. And and I want to underscore that, underline this, is we've given this a lot of attention in our journalism or in our news organization. I've done a lot of stories about this because it really would be the very first time the U.S. Supreme Court has touched public accommodations laws since the civil rights era. And I think in Phil Weiser's view and state solicitor general's view, they would say, you're chipping away at a, at a pretty pure thing right now. Um, and that's dangerous. That's a slippery slope. So when I first read about this case, I like immediately thought about the famous masterpiece cake shop and Jack Phillips, who is the baker who refused to bake a wedding cake for a gay couple. And it just so happens that the group involved with that case is also involved in this one. Um, Allison, can you tell me more about the Alliance Defending Freedom? So Alliance Defending Freedom is a conservative legal organization, um, you know, a little bit like the ACLU, like they sue people, they advocate for conservative causes. Um, They're fairly new. I mean, they haven't been around for more than 20 years, I don't think. Um, I did a story about them a few years ago. They have a lot of money and they have, interestingly, even before the court switched to a conservative majority, they've had a lot of success at the Supreme Court challenging um, cases under First Amendment, um, religious freedom cases is, I think, how they would probably umbrella characterize it. Um, but they so they've got really top-notch Supreme Court lawyers working for them, I mean, people who argue argue cases in front of the high court all the time. Um, they're they're pretty good at their job as a counter to someone like maybe a counterweight to the ACLU um, in these free speech cases, and they've had quite a bit of success. So they have quite a bit of money. And they're, I mean, to be honest, they're pretty media friendly. They like, um, they like NPR and I've always worked with them. I mean, if I have, I call them and say, I want to talk to Lori Smith, they are like, sure. So I I don't want to mischaracterize uh, Alliance Defending Freedom's role in this particular case, but as far as I understand, they sort of exist to say, if, if you want to be the front person of us challenging um, something in society that we feel is unjust, come on over and we'll be, we'll provide you with like maybe a lawyer, PR people, the, the whole, is that, is that how they work? Yes, that's actually a really good characterization in this case, particularly. Like I don't, you know, I'm not an expert in all their cases. They've got, they've, they've got dozens. I mean, I think you, you know, hard be hard pressed to like sort of know how to characterize all of those. In this case in particular, Lori Smith says she wanted to create wedding websites. She felt stymied by the state's public accommodations law. She spoke to her pastor. Her pastor referred her to Alliance Defending Freedom, and here we are. They have clearly wanted to get a resolution on this in Colorado for almost a decade. I mean, the the cake... The, the Masterpiece Cake um, case, you know, was in 2012, so that we're talking 10 years now. Alliance Defending Freedom has been working on this kind of particular cause in Colorado. I mean, I think if they were being honest, they were probably looking for clients, you know, who they could take back up to the court. Um, and I guess Lori Smith fit those criteria of whatever, you know, they think is a good case and that sort of thing. And speaking of that, I mean, if we're looking at the Masterpiece uh cake shop case, different environment in a lot of different ways, but also the Supreme Court was so different. And now it's much more conservative. Um, How or what have you heard from the justices in terms of responses to the oral arguments so far? 
you know, it, it did sort of feel like the conservative justices were definitely pushing the state on whether they really didn't think there should be any exceptions in the state of public accommodations law for creative businesses. Even Elena Kagan, who I would say is considered a more of the liberal justices, was saying, you know, I, I do question whether there should be no loophole, no small carve out for creative businesses versus hotels, for example, to say, I don't really believe in this message. I don't want to speak this message. You can't force me to speak this message. You know, Justice Gorsuch, Neil Gorsuch, also a Coloradan, by the way, he was, I would say, the probably the most prominent in really coming down on the state saying, I just cannot see how you can really force businesses to speak a message they don't believe in. Now, if they asked her to say, God bless this couple, mm. and she said, no, I don't, I don't believe in saying that, Justice Kagan said, that seems like that would be pushing the line of actually compelling her to speak a religious thing that she may not believe in. Yeah, so these, I mean, I just see how these cases are so nuanced, but they can set precedences that we don't know the implications of until they're um, decided on. I mean, it, it would change things in ways that we couldn't comprehend because we cannot make every hypothetical situation known before they make that decision. So I see where it's hard. It's harder in this case because it's an unknown. It's not a real... It's not based on a real thing. It's true. And I think the fear is that because this is the first time there's going to be a public accommodations law, you know, chipped away at, that there's going to be a humongous slippery slope here. What if someone said, I don't believe in disability marriages, like marriages between two disabled people? Like, I don't believe in propagating that. You know, it's like, well, I don't know what that means. Like, does a business owner have the right to do this? I don't know. You know, I think they're going to draw a line between catering and wedding designers. Like, there's a creative element to this. You're under the First Amendment. There's no creative element to making, you know, turkey roll-ups. So you can't discriminate, period. I mean, there's, you know, and I think they're going to try to weave a little, a weave a little, like, what's a creative business? What's not a creative business? Interesting. So that's kind of where the the, the nuance really can lie is like what constitutes a creative business. I think so, among the other nuances. Yeah. So is it a coincidence that these two cases in the last five years involve Colorado businesses? Like are conservative groups like Alliance Defending Freedom sort of targeting Colorado as we inch more and more blue? Well, I think Colorado's public accommodations laws are among the strongest in the country. So I think Colorado does have a target on its back a little with Alliance Defending Freedom. And there was a moment yesterday in the courtroom where the, the lawyer for Alliance Defending Freedom, her name is Kristen Wagner, told the justices, so you're not going to come. They said something. Somebody said something like, are you are you going to come back for caterers? But so I if you win this case, if you prevail here, you know, and the next case involves a caterer, at least your position here is that's different. I won't be coming back with the caterer, but I will be coming back with perhaps a custom wedding cake or a cake that has that, a symbolic the, meaning to it. Okay, but the, so she the still has the, Jack Phillips in her head, unless they decide to rule on it in a more comprehensive way this time. Um, and they might, you know, um, given that I don't think anyone really wants to go through this every few years um, with this debate. You know, it's like at some point, can't we just figure this out? So, Allison, where are we with this case? When should we expect a ruling? So it's with the justices, um, and they are, you know, they can rule any time starting next spring, but they usually reserve their high-profile cases for the very end of the term. So those are usually in May and then in June. And, of course, there's those, like, last days that they like release their biggest decision and I don't know if this is going to be their biggest decision of the term but I have no idea I mean it's a that's like an art that even Supreme Court reporters who've been doing it for 40 years would say like I have no idea when something's going to drop you know you just sure. have to sort of wait just keep watching <laughs> yep Allison Sherry thank you so much thanks Bree Davies it was nice to uh, talk to you again <laughs> And here's what else Denverites are talking about. The Jewish history of West Colfax. 
According to Denverite, some folks in the neighborhood are working with their council members in historic Denver on a proposal to designate part of the West Colfax neighborhood as Denver's third historic cultural district. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a thriving Jewish community lived in the area, supporting pharmacies, grocery stores, and 11 synagogues. While Denver's Jewish community is more dispersed across the city now, a historic cultural district would impose various protections on the area between 16th and 17th Avenue and North Stewart and North Zenobia streets. And finally, remember that huge rainstorm in August that caused a massive flood on I-70? The Colorado Department of Transportation has issued a $45,000 fine to Kewitt, the contractor responsible for the flooding problem. According to Fox 31, Kewitt incorrectly programmed their pumps, which led to the flooding that stranded at least 11 people and damaged nearby property. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed the show, why not take a minute to tell Jack Phillips about us? Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Denver, by texting Denver to 66866. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See you later. In the late 19th and early... Trying to slow down, Aaron. Okay, I'm going to do that one.